Joining me now is a UFC middleweight fighter who takes on Alessio DeChirico at the Ultimate Fighter 27 finale on July 6th in Las Vegas, Nevada. It is the Cuban Missile Crisis himself, Julian Marquez. Julian, how are you? Oh, man, I'm golden. Golden, man. Yourself? I'm doing very well. Uh, it, it's great to talk to you again. I, I very much enjoyed our first conversation back in December before your debut, and obviously it was very cool seeing you pick up that win, that uh, second-round submission over Darren Stewart at UFC on Fox 26. How have you been since that win? It, it's been a few months now. Um, what have you been able to get up to, anything specific, or just sort of training down in Las Vegas? Man, I just I literally just been training the whole time. Um, I have really stopped training. Um, Started uh, focusing on uh, ground game a lot, you know, focused on wrestling and uh, been strolling like that. That's pretty much it. Nothing's changed. Still keeping my life on the same path. How long did it, did it take for that win over Darren Stewart to really sink in? I, uh, of course, you know, you get the second round submission, get fight of the night honors, the big win for you. I, I, I think the crowd really enjoyed it as well. How long did it take for it to sink in? Not only were you a UFC fighter, but you have a one and a record in the octagon. You put on a great fight. How long did that take? Um, man, I don't know. Like it was just, it all was like a blur, you know, like, I mean, I, I train and do this every single day. So like, I don't know, man. It doesn't. It doesn't really change. My mentality isn't changed because I won, and it's like on paper and stuff. I've already felt like I was already there prior to that. Like I've already lived it. You know, I was already in there. You know, it just uh, there's a lot of interviews that came out, and there's a lot of like people that were contacting me, and a lot of fans that came and supported me, and it's it's awesome. But I don't I don't know if it really ever did sink in. I, I felt like it. I felt normal. You know what I mean? I don't know how to explain so, uh, that. So, yeah, as far as the whole experience, getting that win, going to Winnipeg, and then, you know, pre-fight, post-fight, all that, it, it, it was definitely a great feeling, but maybe not life-changing. Is that accurate? Yeah. No, it, it's, yeah, it was, trust me, it's life-changing. It's life, I mean, I get to finally live in the, what I've been doing my whole entire life, but, you know, instead of working four jobs and, uh, you know, working four jobs and going to school, to keep doing the same stuff it's I'm working one job and training all the time like you know I just though the wind's awesome it's cool to get it there but I, I felt like that's who I am it's where I belong like the whole entire time like the, the feeling never changed you mentioned that you still have one job. It's a lot less than four it's a lot uh, smaller workload but I'm yeah. curious what, what do you do besides fighting? Uh, I work for Top Golf. Uh, here in Las Vegas. It's a target oriented to practice. Um, we have 11 targets out on our field, and you can go there with your friends. You can drink some uh, some drinks. You can eat some food and hit some golf balls into some targets, and it keeps score like bowling. But it's uh, you have specific targets like darts. Very cool. Is that like a typical 9 to 5 job for you, or are the hours a bit more flexible? How does that work? Uh, the hours are flexible. Um, they, they work with me so I can get my training in, but I'll work 20 hours a week still. Is the hope uh, to leave that job sooner than later? No, I don't want to leave it. No? No. Like, I've worked, I mean, <laughs> I've worked a job through training and everything and my, my whole entire career, and I still would work a job regardless. Uh, I mean, it just it keeps you grounded. You know, it reminds you what you came for while you're doing it. Plus, I love top golf. So sure. Do you think that's sort of the smart route to take? Just because some fighters, once they get their first performance bonus, I mean, you did in your first fight for Fight of the Night, of course. Um, they you know, once they get that money, they'll sort of be able to leave their job and train full time. Some people think that's crucial. You seem to think otherwise. You actually, I mean, in a way, this is smarter because, or 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 it could be smarter. It depends on everyone's situation. Everyone has a different one, but. You know, MMA, you don't make tons of money. You don't know how m many times you're going to fight. You could get hurt. So having something besides fighting isn't always the worst way to go. Yeah, I, I just like, I, I like working, you know. Like, my entire life is between work and training. Outside of that, I don't really do too much. I don't go out and party. I don't go out and do stuff. And I'd always like a source of income coming in. Plus, you know, Top Golf has always supported me through my fighting career. So, 
regardless if I have to take some time off, I always have my job to go back to. And, you know, like I said, I guess that's why, to answer your first question, that's what keeps me, you know, not feeling like anything's changed because I, I didn't, nothing changed. I'm still the same person as I was, you know, when you met me before my first UFC debut. And I think people change whenever they get some money. They think they're in a different standpoint. But to be honest, like, you know, everything can go away in one second. So I'm, I'm, I'm always going to be me. How important always going to be grounded. I always know where I came from. How important is it to keep that mindset? Because you are you are one hundred percent accurate as far as you know. Once some fighters get their first win or their second win, or maybe they break into the top fifteen, or or some big uh, shift in momentum, or or some big accomplishment, they turn into completely different people. They're you know you know they look at other people differently, or they act differently, or they think they're bigger than they really are. How important is it not to? almost get fully of yourself because it, it something like that is easy to do as a pro fighter on FS1 on the biggest stage, you know, knocking people out. I, I would imagine some fighters, it's kind of a battle not to get ahead of yourself in a way. Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, you can always get ahead of yourself. It's important to remember where you came from because to be honest, like where I came from, these people were the people that helped me out, you know, like, these, you know, top golf, um, my family, uh, my friends that I grew up with, these are the people that helped encourage me. When no one knew who I was, when no one cared to bother and turn their head at me, like, these people were the people that kept supporting me and kept pushing me and kept encouraging me. So I, I, that's who I am. That's where I came from. You know, I, I came from a struggle. I came from this, and it, it keeps you able to – it keeps you able to remember your, your roots. It keeps you, you that, that fire ignited inside you to want to keep doing better because it's not just me that's making it. It's my city. It's my family. It's my friends. It's my job. It's the people around me. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this all for myself, but they all live with me. They all live vicariously through me. So it's like uh, I'm, I think it's important to remember where you came from. I think it's important to – to know that life doesn't change, you know, whether you break your leg, whether something crazy happens where you lose someone close to you, whether anything happened, life still goes on. So, you know, why, why try to act like you're better than it? Fair enough. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about the Darren Stewart fight. Were you happy with the actual, your, your actual performance? Uh, I mean, to be honest, like, it's cool, don't get me wrong, like, that that performance got me the fight of the night deal, and they always say, like, each fighter brings a different fighter out of you, and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't control my adrenaline in that fight, so beforehand, I was dancing and having fun, and I, like, I enjoyed every bit of it, I love that kind of fight, you know, if you want to, if you want to go into a brawl, let's go, but, yeah, to be honest, like, I could critique it all day and night. And uh, I, I'm satisfied with that performance because that performance got me where I am and got me the notoriety it did. I'm not going to ever take that performance back, you know? Is there stuff that I can improve? Yeah, for sure. I think it was also very memorable just because it was a lot of fun. You were dancing before and probably after too. Um, and I think a lot of fans noticed that. And I think you gained a lot of fans. And so even though it maybe wasn't the most picture perfect performance you could have, you still got the job done. You got an extra 50K. And I think you won over a lot of fans. So as a first impression, oh, yeah. I think it, it's sort of ideal. Oh, no, it's perfect. It's exactly, it's exactly how it should have been, you know? That's exactly how my fight should have went. That's why I'm not, you know, I'm not mad at the performance. I'm not yeah. upset with it, you know. But there's always improvements. I could have went out there and had a uh, perfect fight, say a one-punch KO, and I would tell you, hey, man, I probably needed to change something, you know, because that's just, you're just always, always trying to get better, always wanting to get better, you know. But I, I'm happy with what it was. I'm proud of how it went down and, you know, I'm not going to change it and look back on it and hate on it. I love it. And as you mentioned, you were dancing on the way to the Octagon during your walkout. Your post-fight interview was a lot of fun. You challenged Tyron Woodley, the UFC Waltway champion, to a beard off. And, and again, you put on a great fight. Um, is that just you being you? 
Yeah, I mean, that's me. Like, I, I'm not, like, again, when the camera comes on, like, I, I'm not going to change who I am. Like, if I don't like talking about certain things, I won't talk about them. I'll change it up. But to be honest, like, I, I, I love, I love fighting, but, like, I want to know something different about people, you know? Like, we all know that Tyron is just, like, dude, he's a savage, you know? He's the champion. But most people don't know anything else about him besides his, you know, his fight capability or his wrestling credentials, um, you know? And it's just like, well, let's see his fun side. And I challenged him to a beard off. And you know what? He was he was joking around with me every time we run around. Like, you see each other, we just joke around about our beards. We take photos with each other. Like, it's a different side of the fight world. Like, all people think of us as our – all people think of fighters as, like, just, you know, naive, um, head strong, just, like, I don't, I don't want to say adrenaline junkie, but just cocky people that are just, like, these mean dudes. And to be honest, we're just fun people. We just like to enjoy. We enjoy life. We joke around, you know. When the camera gets on, like, people change their personalities to better fit the, the fighter persona. But when the camera's off, these people aren't really the same style, you know, and it's, it's not bad or it's not good. It's just, I'm just a fun person. And I like to do funny things and maybe weird and offset, but I enjoy it, man. And I enjoy bringing that out of other people too. Do you feel like it's almost your mission? I mean, obviously you want to get to the top of the middleweight division, win the title one day, be a top contender, but in a way, it is, it's one of your goals to prove these people wrong, these fans that think, hey, every fighter on the planet, you know, as you said, an adrenaline junkie, uh, you know, a cocky person, et cetera, et cetera. Is it sort of, is that your goal to prove those people? Say, hey, look at me, look at these other people. We're not just all that. Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm trying to prove anything. I'm just trying to, to show that there's different sides of it, you know. I'm showing that these people are fun, you know. Like, I, I talked to a lot of people. I had Jared Candon here um, stay at my house uh, last week because he needed to use the Performance Institute. And we're hanging out, and me and him just stand out. We nerded out about the Affinity Wars movie, you know. But most people wouldn't know that he loves – uh, Marvel comic books, or he, he read Marvel comic books. Most people wouldn't know that because they don't ask those type of questions. They don't get to know who the fighter is or who they are in a personality. Um, as well as, like, you know, Max Griffin just posted out a tweet today saying that Batman is a terrible... He said Batman is a terrible superhero. He has no powers. And it caused this whole, like, rift in Twitter, well, on me, it's just like, oh, I love Batman, Mike. Well, you need to calm down. But it's just, it's something other than fighting that we have, that we have knowledge of and stuff like that. Like, I guess I, I just want to show, like, different personalities, different backgrounds, different fun sides of people that you can actually ask them questions and get to know them a little bit better. You know, I, I don't want people to look at me and just only be like, hey, this guy's a fighter and that's all it is. Like, like oh, you know, Julian Marquez, yeah, dude. Do you know that dude dances, you know, or did you know that dude's a tumbling coach or did you know that he, uh, he loves comic books? I just want people to see other stuff. There's other things besides fighting because no matter what you just be like, yeah, he's, he's a savage when he steps in the ring, you know, like I guess I, my, my goal is to prove that there's other sides of us and it, not prove. I don't want to show that there's a fun side to us as well as a serious side. You know what? You've probably heard this before, but I think you would make a fantastic podcast host. Uh, I've, I've heard that before. I, I'm trying to start one up, but it just I don't think I'm going to do a podcast. I think podcasts are too long. I think I want to do like a YouTube channel, five minutes where I just take people out and just do some different style weird things and show personality. I think that would be just as good, if not better. I, I think, yeah, I, I think being able to see you as well, like see you in action doing stuff, I think that might sort of, I don't know, be even better than just talking. Oh, it is. Have you, like, Joe Benavides, I, I hang out with these guys every day at the Performance Institute. There's a lot of fighters that come through. There's a lot of people that come there. But I, I sit there with Joe Benavides every, like, literally every day. And I talk to him, and he's very inspirational. Um, 
if you look at some of his t-shirts, a lot of people put out fight t-shirts and they put out things that are just basically, you know, just, hey, that's a fighter shirt. You know, like, that's just marketing that. But, like, if you look at Joe Benavides' new shirt, it's a very unique design. Like, they have different stuff where it, it, it expresses him, but also it's like um, his, his last week release was a uh, – it, it looked like an album cover, you know, to where you can actually wear this shirt out and you can go out to a, I don't know, go out to, like, a, a nice place with, like, a T-shirt, like, hang out with your friends, and it doesn't look like it's a fight T-shirt. It looks like he's having, he's supporting an album. He's supporting something else. It's just a unique um, style of design and a unique eye. But, like, that's something most people don't realize that Joe Benavides has. He's a very unique, um, he's a very unique look, a very unique style, but it is very intelligent. It's the same way, like, as if you looked at, um, Versace, like his style was different in clothing. And people at first probably were brought off down about it, but then they started realizing, oh, wow, like Versace or Armani, these people have like really, really nice styles. And that's something like Joe has that I want to help express out is looking at his style of the clothing and like his eye that he has because it's unique to each fighter. But again, most people know Joe as fighter and he's just a he's a savage when he gets in the cage yeah and one thing Benavides has done recently I, I've seen on on uh, Instagram he's gotten pictures of all these fighters backstage and clothes and they're you know showing off their their fashion and he's sort of done a series out of that I'm I'm assuming you yeah you've seen that. scrapper da dapper scrappers there you go dapper scrappers is uh yeah and it's awesome and it's true because like the whole point of his dapper scrappers is it about who wore stuff better or what it is it's just looking at how people come together how different fighters have styles and put things together and it's really cool it's really cool if you sit it back and look at it and the way joe is wanting to look at it it's just awesome to see a personality like because each person has a different personality correct sure. so when you look at their style it actually complements their personality it complements who they are and it shows who they are where, you know, where if you look at my style that day, I, I had like a hippie style with a fedora on, a red <laughs> shirt, and some boots. And it, it looked like a, a like a, you would call it like a hippie style, but it's just a style that I had. And then if you look at, you know, Nick Baldwin for if you look at Yair Rodriguez, he was just completely dressed up. He looked very, very clean. Um, he had that, you know, I, I would go with, like, a European or a Hispanic style um, when you go out. Just he had, like, a little suit, blazer, some nice dress shoes. And, then look, he looked amazing. And then you go with Eric Spicely, who's wearing Supreme stuff, fanny pack, um, with just regular clothes. Like, it's just each person's, like, a different style. And it looks really cool. And it, it brought out a different image from who a fighter was or what, what they are beyond the fight, you know. And when we spoke in Winnipeg in your hotel room, I'm looking back now, you were wearing a Power Rangers shirt, just uh, just to remind you. Oh, 100%. <laughs> if you ever, if you ever, like, I, I love, I love, um, like, 90s things. Like, I, obviously, I grew up in the 90s, but I love right. comic books. I love superheroes and everything. And I have, I have Power Rangers. Um, you know, if you, you came to my house, I have a wall completely filled with toys that are little figurines of Harry Potter, of Power Rangers, of um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, WWE stars, um, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, Disney, and they're just a collection of just my personality and things that I really like. Um, in movies, I have movie pictures, all, like posters all over my house that are just scenes from movies that I enjoy throughout my life. John Wick, Nightmare Before Christmas, um, Friday the 13th, Jason, and we can just keep going on and on. Yeah. Um, that is all very awesome. I, I do want to talk to you about the fight coming up, and I'm sure we'll speak again before it, so maybe we won't talk about the exact matchup or anything, but you're taking on Alessio DiCirico, and one thing that I find a little interesting is that he fought on the card you debuted on last uh, December in Winnipeg, UFC on Fox 26. Now, uh, obviously, if you had seen seen him there or anything, you wouldn't have thought twice about it, but did you happen to see him there? Did you say anything to him? Uh, did, do you remember you know him being there? 
Man, you know what? It's it just, it's funny how it worked out. But uh, so I, I remember his knockout. I remember looking up and I was in the back room and uh, it was just me. Jordan Mean actually just walked back in to the room and we were congratulating him and, congratulating him, and we all looked up together and we watched him, uh, we watched Alessio hit that savage knockout on a Wale and it went down. We we're just like, oh, wow. Like we were actually like pretty excited. We didn't think that fight was going to end like that just because the, the style of Wale was trying to do, um, which was a perfect way to try to defeat Alessio. Um, but we, we sat there and then I went out and had my fight. But I remember coming back doing after the interviews and everything. And we, I walked back there and, uh, my coaches left. They went to go to my dad and my brother. Um, and we're in the green room. And I remember looking at him. And, like, he looked at me. But, like, it wasn't, like, a, a congratulative, like, look. It wasn't a, like, good job. He just, like, stared at me, like, if, if I did something wrong. And I just felt it, it was just an awkward presence, hmm. how it was. But, like, it, was, it wasn't just him. It was his whole, like, crew that looked at me. And I just thought nothing of it. And then now that, like, now that how we, like, had the offer come up and everything, I feel as if he asked for the fight, really? which was even beyond, like, yeah, I think he asked to fight me. And then they were like, yeah, that would be a great style. So, like, they waited to put us together. Um, just, yeah, they, they waited to put us two together. I mean, why, how else is it that we both six months later on the same card fighting each other, like, I feel like he was, he asked to fight me. And I think it's awesome, man. I feel honored. And if it isn't, then either way, I still feel honored. But if he asked to fight me, I feel honored that he would want to fight me. You know what I mean? That means he thinks um, that I, I, he thinks that I'm capable of, you know, keeping up with him. And I think that's great. He's an amazing fighter. Um, he's fought some of the best, um, some tough people. And he, his style just matches up perfect with me. Like, we'll have another exciting fight, you know? I find that really interesting because I think it, it, in mo a lot of fighters, I, I can't say most, but I think a lot of fighters, if they realized or somehow knew that their opponent wanted to fight them, they would almost take that almost, you know, the wrong way and be a little offended. Like, oh, this guy wanted to fight me. Well, I'll show him. I, I, I think it's a little refreshing that you think completely otherwise, that you're honored to you know, have been asked to fight you. Yeah. Well, because, I mean, there's a reason why people call you out, right? Sure. There's a reason, whether if it's public or underneath the table, like, there's a reason why they call you out. And, like, especially, you know, coming off the Dana White Contender Series, coming off the my first fight in Winnipeg and everything, like, it, there's a lot of hype around me. So, like, you know, I feel like people are trying to take that hype away. And which again, cool, man. I don't, I really don't give a shit, you know, like hype or no hype. Like, I feel like there's something there that he finds intriguing to fight me. And I, I want that because if you want to fight me, if you ask to fight me, then that means like, we are going to have a show. We're going to have a fight. You know what I mean? Like that means you really want to, whereas if you just kind of like going through the motions and this, that, and the other, and, um, it's not really like you're not 100% into it. So six months of time, like if he's asked to fight me and he's been waiting for it, that means he's been training for me for six months, which is good because, I mean, I haven't been training for anybody but to beat myself for the past six months. So I've just gotten stronger and everything. And that means you're trying to fight somebody six months ago at the time. And I'm a different fighter, a different breed, and a different day. So, you know, you might get caught – Stuff you, in, you know the past do you think that evening what you know in the green room after you both had fought and he sort of gave you a weird glance and you look back do you think he knew right then that hey i want to fight that guy i, I don't know i, I i'm a, like again this is me being like just how everything went down like i feel as if you know he he, he wanted to fight i think they they looked at it they probably you know they probably watched the fight he was before me they got the chance to relax and see everything um, and they probably were like, Hey, that would be a good matchup for you. And then they probably sat there and then they requested an ask because you can ask for your next fight. This is me just being like putting stuff together. I feel as if it's all speculation, but ask for me. Yeah, it's all speculation. 
because I mean I got offered to fight him earlier, but I was unable to do it um, for family obligations. And then three months later from that fight, we were it's the same opponent. You know, like it just feels as if it was like that, or the offer was just both on the table, and you know they liked the fight, they accepted it. We just both couldn't do the dates, so they pushed it there. You know, stipulation. But again, I love it. I think he's great. Uh, he has a lot of heart. He has a lot of power. He has a lot of skill. Um, he's from Rome, and they or I uh, think he's from he's from Italy. I don't know if he's from Rome. Uh, I need to double check my facts, but. You know, they're they're very passionate out there in what they do. Um, like Marvin Vittori, like everybody just backs him up, and he shows a lot of heart. And I love fighting fighters with a lot of heart because it means that they're not going to slack off. They're not going to overlook you. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to think, like, they're not going to take you lightly. And I don't want to. You know what I mean? Like, I, I want to fight. Alessio is from Rome, so you did get it right, by the way. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So I, I, I love it, man. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, sort of backtracking a little bit, but what did that Fight of the Night 50K extra bonus do for you as a person, as a fighter, you know, for your career? Because, again, I mean, fighters, you guys don't make the most money in the world when you're talking about pro athletes on, on live, on, you know, national television. You know, this was a big Fox card after all. But what what did that mean to you? How important, how nice was it to get that, that big bonus? Um, dude, it was awesome. Like, it's cool, man, like that. Like, coming into a lot of money when you barely have money um, is definitely life-changing, um, and it switches it up. But, uh, I, it, I mean, it helped me help the ones around me. That's what it did, you know, and that's what I used it for. Like, I, I live in a place where I don't pay that much rent. I, I mean, I, I'm able to pay my rent up for it, so I'm, I'm able to afford my living um, up and I have money stored away, but honestly, like I've, I've used that money for other people more than I have myself. You know, I still don't have anything nice in my own home. I still don't like anything nice. Like I, I didn't go out and buy a car. I didn't go buy a house. I didn't buy any like fancy necklaces or jewelry. You know, I might've bought some toys and that's pretty much it. But a lot of the money that I used was to help people that were around me that helped me out while, when I was down, you know, or uh, they'd been there to support me and they needed help. So it helped me help me help them. That is very awesome to hear. Um, this fight against Alessio DiCirco, part of International Fight Week, unfortunately not the massive pay for you, but it is the uh, tough finale the night before, so still a big card. It is in Las Vegas, I believe. Is this at the T-Mobile Arena, or is that, or is that a... No, we're, or, at the, we're at the Palms Casino. Okay. Um, yeah, it's actually the biggest card that weekend. I don't, I don't really know why you guys think, just because it's not pay-per-view, it's not the biggest card. That is <laughs> the card to watch, you know? Um the, the the Super Bowl card that you have on Saturday is amazing. You know, you have a lot of great matchups. But if you don't realize, like, you have a lot of up-and-comers and a lot of uh, changes in the day before on the 6th. You have the Ultimate Fighter finale, yeah. which is coming from an undefeated season where it has a bunch of people that are top prospects that will be fighting on that. You also have um, Roxanne Modafari is farting Barb on there, which that's another, that's a high end, um, high anticipated, you know, fight from way back, you know, they fought once before, but from the Ultimate Fighter, their season, you know, like that was supposed to happen before Roxanne went to go fight, uh, went to go fight, uh, um, Nico Montagna. It was this Nico Montagna. She went to go fight there. So, like, this right there could be the winner of that one could next fight for the belt again. So you have, the 125 still moving for the female. Then as well as we have another 85 uh, pound matchup. You have, uh, what is it, Mershart? Um, how do you say his name? Is uh, Gerald Mershart versus, I, I yeah. don't, what, who's his Oscar opponent? Pershota, yep, Pershota. That, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, they're fighting there, so that's another, that's another um, big fight that's coming up. You know, those people can move up the ladder and – I mean, they're both coming off impressive finishes. And then you have Brad Tavares versus 
Israel Alasanya, like yep. that that card right there is pay per view worthy. It's just the UFC is giving it to the fans so they can, you know, they can see something without having to spend a crap load of money. You know, they can enjoy it while watching it on Fox. Like it's that card is still a Super Bowl worthy card. Maybe you'll get some angry stare, stares from the winner of Pashota versus Mershart, just like you did uh, uh, from the, the Jericho winner. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I feel like me and Alessio would be, like, side by side in the the way we move up. Like, we're both on the same tier. I feel like Mershart and uh, Pashota, I feel, is that how you say his name, Pashota? I think Pashota. I, I don't know exactly, though. Pashota? Um, I feel like, it, like they are at a higher tier, like, the winner of that is going to fight someone in the top 15. I feel like they're they're up there, you know. They've fought multiple times in the UFC. Um, they fought higher caliber, you know. Then myself, I doubt they're going to try to come after me, um, which is fine, you know. Like, you know, I'm chipping away at the tree. You know, I'm just going to go up little by little, leveling up my character one, uh, one level at a time. I'm not trying to skip, not trying to jump. Unless they say, hey, man, someone needs to fight for the title. No one will take a short notice fight. I'll jump in it, you know. Like, But other than that, I'm going to take a chip little by little and move my way up. Does this feel like a bigger fight because it is part of such a big weekend? Uh, not really. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's on an amazing card. Don't get me wrong. Like, It's on an amazing card, but every fight's always going to be the biggest fight of your career. Um. It doesn't matter who you fight or who you put in front of you. Um, but, again, this is who I am. This is where I want to be. It's not going to change my feelings. It's not going to change my personality. It's not going to change uh, the way I look at it. It's it's amazing, and I'm blessed to be at where I'm at. But this is what I do every day. This is what I live for every day. So uh, I feel like it's just a, it's another card that's been amazing and – it goes back to whenever I was fighting um, at the beginning of my career when I wasn't in the UFC. The cards that I fought on were still amazing as well. How nice is it to be fighting in Vegas where you've been training most recently? And and correct me if how, how you know I, maybe I've asked you this uh, before, but do you live full time in Vegas now? Uh yeah, I've, I've lived in full time in Vegas for two years. Okay. How nice is it to be uh, fighting uh, where you live? You, no travel, going up to Winnipeg in December where it's super cold. I'm sure that wasn't ideal. Uh, Vegas is hot, and it will be super hot in July. But how how nice is it fighting at home? Man, you know I've only fought at home one time, and that was on the Contender Series, and I wasn't able to tell anybody until uh, when John Jones and Daniel Cormier fought when they like announced it out. Um, so like. It, it's going to be it's, it's different and weird, but I think it's it's great, man. I'm, I'm on home turf. Like, I'm comfortable in the city. I know where everything's at. So it'd definitely be, it'd definitely be awesome, you know. It'd be great. But don't get me wrong, I love to travel. Like, if they ask me to fight in Winnipeg again, oh, yeah, man, I'll be there in a heartbeat. Like, I love that place. The fans were amazing. And International Fight Week, you know, the fans are going to be amazing as well. You know, like – you're going to have people from all over the world coming in to watch back-to-back fights. Um, and everybody's just going to be excited for what Vegas has to bring for International Fight Week and all the stuff outside of fighting as well. So, like, everyone's just going to be – I think everyone's going to be in a positive mindset. Everyone's going to have fun. Everyone's going to enjoy the time. And for myself to be able to perform inside of that positivity circle – that area where everybody's just there for the reasons of fights because they love it. Like that's a blessing, man. That's exciting. You you remember how cold Winnipeg was, right? You had the furnace yeah, cranked was, up to way way too hot. All of that, dude. Yeah, ours was terrible. Yeah, we Celsius, man. Celsius is totally <laughs> different from Fahrenheit. I didn't know that the offset. I didn't realize I had a ninety in my room. But yeah. <laughs> Would you believe it if I told you that right now in Winnipeg it is 87 degrees Fahrenheit? I see. Uh, okay, you said Fahrenheit. I was about to say 87 degrees. So I was like, dang, that's pretty hot, dude. Um, no, yeah, uh, I definitely would have. Uh, I definitely wouldn't believe it. You know, I only know Winnipeg with snow. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, but I, I looked at Vegas me. weather. 
And uh, it's not quite there, but hey, can't beat Vegas. Oh, it's, Vegas is dry. Everybody was telling me, like, hey, man, you need to come to Winnipeg during the winter. Or not during the winter, during the summertime. You can go fishing. It's amazing. So uh, that's one of those, like, I, I kind of, like, it's like on my bucket list to go out to Winnipeg to go fishing and to go see the sites in the summertime. I don't, I don't want to ice fish. No, I don't, yeah. want to be out there I, I don't hear bucket list going to Winnipeg too often, so that's that's good. But yeah, Winnipeg in, in in the winter is a little chilly. But during the summer, now Winnipegers complain all the time. Maybe we're just greedy, but Winnipeg in the summer is really not that bad of a place whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw I saw what Winnipeg looked like when I was out there, and we drove from the airport and drove around, and it it it's just it's a big city, but there's a lot of surrounding areas around it surrounding lakes and stuff so yeah yeah i'd yeah, like yeah. to see it with no snow absolutely so say you get the job done july 6th you, you defeat a lesser to Chirica, whether it's by knockout submission or decision do you want to fast track to the top 15 you'd be 2-0 in the ufc coming off the contender series have that hype around you or would you prefer to be built up a bit slower man you know i'm 27 years old and um i don't need to sprint i don't need to to do anything like that um you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. I, I'm my goal is to get to gold, and however I can get to it, um, that's the smartest way for my career. Then I will. I also love to fight. So, you know, the faster you move up, the tougher it is to fight. Uh, as you, I, I've been seeing a lot of fighters, you know, having troubles getting fights and finding the correct matchups. If so and so is fighting, you have to wait until they're done fighting and then go after the next one and just keep going from there. Right now, man, I'm just trying to move up and pretty much take a notch out of each board and just go there because my entire career, um, no one knew who I was until I kicked somebody in the face and then people are now looking over and I feel like they still forget about you. They have all this noise going and they kind of, you're on the back burner and the next thing you know, boom, you've been here for years, but they just now remembered you, you know what I mean? Like. So uh, I'm going to take it how how it seems fit during the time. I can't answer right now if I'm going to sprint or if I'm going to jog or if I'm going to walk. But either way, I'm going to enjoy the ride. One more question before Julian, before I do let you go. And uh, thanks again for taking the time. I know we've gone a bit long, but it's great catching up. Uh, this is something I wanted to talk to you about Way back in December, totally forgot uh, before that uh, that uh, that Darren Stewart fight. Your nickname, the Cuban Missile Crisis. There has to be some sort of story here. Oh man, it's a it's a story for sure. Um, I was fighting back home at, at KCFA, and uh, I was fighting a kid that was ten and zero. He was the biggest prospect in Kansas City. Um, this was my second fight in Kansas City. My, my most of my uh, amateur career, uh, I had, I think, twelve fights as an amateur, but majority of it was outside of Kansas City. Um, so we were fighting there, and I guess while I was in the back warming up and doing all my stuff, um, the ring announcer Ozone was talking to a group of people. There's Anthony Shark Bay Gutierrez, um, who was on Ultimate Fighter, um, Dallas Browning. Um, uh, who else? Uh, Courtney Browning um, and some other people. I can't remember as much who they were, but they're all sitting there and they're like, hey, man, um, what's Julian's nickname? And everyone's coming up a nickname because I didn't have one. So, you know, you can't give yourself a nickname. You have to be dubbed it. So they dubbed me. Um, everyone's saying, like, do the Cuban assassin, and people were arguing, like, everybody's an assassin somehow. Like, forget this. And I, I'm Courtney Browning. She was like, how about the Cuban Missile Crisis? And, like, everybody, like, I guess stopped and looked over at her. And they just, like, the Cuban, the Cuban Missile Crisis Marquez, like, okay, okay, we like it. So everyone, I guess, agreed upon it. So the funny part is I'm about to walk out for the number one, um, for my fight, the biggest fight of my career at the point. Um, it's to claim the number one Kansas City fighter, um, Julian Marquez, that was um, eight and two at the time or, uh, seven and seven and two at the time against Danny Click, who was ten and 0, 11 and 0 at the time, undefeated. Um, and they call my name. They say Julian, the Cuban Missile Crisis Marquez. And I sat there and waited for my name because I felt like the name was too long. 
you know, I didn't know they announced my name, and everyone's like pushing me, like, hey, Julian, go, go. And I look, and I said, they say my name? And they said, yeah. He said, but they said the Cuban Missile Crisis. And they're like, yeah, that's your name. And I'm like, what? Oh, okay. So I actually, like, walk out, and I'm laughing at this time because I'm just like, what the hell just happened? Like, how did I my name switch? So uh, I guess long story is that I got dubbed it without even knowing it. And uh, it was dubbed on the spot within, like, I guess, three minutes. Hmm. And it stuck because it's a fantastic Nick thing. Uh, once you heard it, I assume you fell in love with it pretty quickly. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I love it because, one, it, it's actually a very giant, like, um, it, it gets people to understand and wanting to look more into the Cuban Missile Crisis because it was a huge it was a huge deal um, back in the day. And, uh, you know, I, I want people to actually look it up. Like, they've heard the Cuban Missile Crisis, but they don't really know exactly what it is about. And, uh, you know, having a name that represented something that could have definitely ended the war, like, ended the entire world, um, it's pretty it, – it, it's, it's intriguing. And uh, it's an historical event, um, which, again, I like it because – no one else has it. No one else has uh, – it's unique. It's something different, and you can't really imitate it, you know. You can imitate all these other names and go to another thing and try to switch people's name around. Like, there's it's 10 cool, but it's – yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of there, – there's a whole bunch of assassins. Um, and it's good. It's, it's how they want. It's what they work for. But to me, it's one of one, you know. Like, I am one of one. And I am, I am myself. I stand alone. I, I'm different. And that that nickname is one of one. You can't change it. You can't mimic it. You can't alter the the history of it. Um, it's one of one, and it expresses who I am. So I, I absolutely love it. If a second Cuban Cuban Missile Crisis comes around, uses that as their nickname, I think you have to have a word with them. As you said, you can't copy that. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. But... Well, Julian, thank you so much for taking the time. It's uh, always great uh, talking to you. A lot of fun. Um, best of luck to you in July. I know we're uh, just just under two months. Two months uh, to go yesterday. So very much looking forward to it. That is, of course, the Ultimate Fighter 27 finale. You will be taking on Alessio DiCirico, uh most likely on the main card. Julian, before I let you go, remind my audience where they can find you on social media. And if there's anybody you'd like to thank or give a shout-out to, the floor is yours. Hey guys, you can find me on jmarquezmma dot or MMA, and uh, that is on Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram. Um, shoot you me a message. Let's have a conversation outside of fighting, or we can talk about fighting. It's whatever you want. Um, as well as I'd like to say, Top Golf Las Vegas, BLT Foods, the UFC Performance Institute, um, the entire staff that works in the cafeteria that helps me with my meal planning, uh, Clint. Uh, Bo, Duncan, James, Kyle, Matt, uh, just keep going, Heather, Bobby, we just keep going, Tanner, um, I love them all, without these guys I uh, wouldn't be able to be in the position I am today, um, shout out to 10 Planet Las Vegas, and uh, my family and friends, appreciate it.